right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, gosh, what a joy and a pleasure to be able to gather and worship with you during this Advent season. Uh, Pastor Reese, thank you again for your hospitality. If I could just take a quick moment uh, to maybe just give you a, a, a glimpse into the work that I'm doing uh, besides traveling and speaking. I'm serving as the president of an, a Christian um, advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. called Bread for the World. And if you get a chance, sometime this week, when you're online, just go ahead and check out bread.org. Uh, Bread for the World is probably one of the more well-known Christian advocacy organizations, and our calling is to help end hunger in our nation and around the world. Uh, and our work is specifically with advocacy. So I spend the majority of my time with the administration, with members of Congress. It's a very challenging time in the world of polarization, and yet this is where God has called us to do this work. Uh, it happens to be uh, that we have neighbors uh, in our nation, but also around the world that are experiencing hunger right now. One out of every 10 children in the United States experience food insecurity, even some in our own pews probably. And then in our world right now, it is the worst hunger crisis in nearly 50 years right now. Uh, Bread for the World, we've just been working on this one bill. As an example, it's called the Global Malnutrition Prevention and Treatment Act. We've been working on this bill for three years. Uh, and about two months ago, the president signed it into law. And so it's a reminder of the hard work. And that one single bill... Uh, that one single bill will impact tens of millions of women and children around the world. So if you get a chance, check out bread.org. Let me give you a roadmap of how we want to spend uh, the next 35 or so minutes together. Uh, in a short bit, I want to lead us in a time of prayer. We're going to read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses, uh, uh, chapter one, verses 35 to, I believe, 45. And then I want to share with you four main points to help us dig into the question that I want to pose to you right now to think about throughout the entire sermon, but actually throughout this entire week. And here's the question, what song are you singing? What song are you singing? So friends, with that in mind, please join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for this opportunity to open up your scriptures to study the word of God. We ask for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to be with us. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight and all God's people said, amen, amen. So Luke chapter 1. Verses 46 to 55 is our scripture reading for today. Now, before we start reading this, I do want to give you just some context, some background to better understand what we're about to read. This scripture reading is often known for those who study the Gospel of Luke as Mary's Magnificat. It's known as Mary's Song. It's probably the most well-known song in the Gospels, but it also happens to be that there are four songs recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the only writer in the Gospels who actually devotes time to record the four songs. And musicians theologians, they call this the four canticles in the gospel of Luke. Now, we're not going to go through all of them, but I actually want you to know that there is something to this idea that people are singing songs throughout their lives. They're singing songs. You might wake up in the morning and you might be humming a tune or a song. There might be a song in a season of your life, whether it's a worship song or a hymn or even a pop culture song, if we're honest, that somehow gets us. 
There are unhealthy songs that we sing. There are life-giving songs that we sing. There are songs that God deposits into our life that keeps coming out of our lips. And so Luke spends time on these four canticle, lyrical songs. There's Mary's Magnificat, which we'll get to. There is Zacharias Benedictus. These are all Latin titles. We also have the angels Gloria. And then we have Simeon's song called Nunc Dimittis, which literally means the song of Simeon. It's the song of waiting and expectation. So, Today, as we're talking about Mary's Magnificat, here's the context of what's going on. When we read it, you've got to read it or hear it in song, because she's basically singing this out of joy. So this song of Mary, the context is the angel Gabriel reveals himself to both Zacharias and Mary on two separate occasions. And the angel reveals to them that they're going to have a miracle baby. The first is going to be the forerunner of the second who will be the son of God. So Mary enters the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth blesses Mary as the baby jumps for joy in the womb. And Mary, hearing the words of blessing from Elizabeth, this is what Mary does. She breaks out into song. But not just any song. She breaks out into song to God. This prayer is a song of adoration to God. It's a song of joy. So I want to ask you the question again. What song are you singing? Are we singing songs of self-adoration and self-adulation, basically about me, myself, and I? Are we singing the songs that our culture tends to elevate? Or I pray that you would be heeding and responding to the love and grace and peace of Christ and singing a song of adoration to God. So friends, now... Let's hear the word of God. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. And Mary said, my soul, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Amen. So friends, this is Mary's song of joy. Mary's song of joy. We know that during this Advent season, as we're reflecting upon the question, what song are you singing? The truth is, the Advent Christmas season can be quite chaotic. And I sometimes wonder that while the Advent Christmas season can be fun, because of rituals and rhythms and family gatherings and gift exchanges and watching our favorite Christmas films. In my opinion, there is no debate what the greatest Christmas film is. It's Elf. (laughs) Thanks for coming to church. We'll see you next week. But... Amid those fun things, it can also be incredibly stressful. 
there's busyness and then anxiety. And part of the challenge is that what was meant to be this opportunity for us as followers of Jesus to reflect upon God becoming one of us in the birth of Jesus, if we're not careful, we're going to miss it. And I sometimes wonder in the Advent season as we're focusing on peace and hope and joy and love, if it wasn't for the Advent season, would we be reflecting on these things at all? Like if we're not having church right now, would we be missing this opportunity to be still and to reflect on the goodness of God? So in other words... Mary's song, Mary's song of joy, Mary's Magnificat, where she's calling out this joyous adoration to God. I'm convinced that there are some things in life that if you're not intentional, it's just not going to happen. I can't speak for you, but for me, my natural inclination If I'm not strategic and prayerful and thoughtful, my natural proclivity is to complain. My natural inclination is to find reasons to be upset. And it feels like the the, the currency in our culture today is fear. It's outrageousness. So the topic of this series, A Christmas to Believe in, is utterly, utterly essential for us to say, how am I going to be intentional in these things to be singing a new song, a song that reflects glory back unto God? There's an author by the name of Henry Nouwen, who's a a very uh, well-known Catholic theologian and priest. He's not often known in evangelical circles. And so I would encourage you, if you're looking for a great book to read, Henry Nouwen, uh, he writes a book called Life of the Beloved. It's a phenomenal book. But in one of his books, he speaks about joy. He speaks about it because he himself acknowledges that it's a challenge in his life. And in his book, he says, quote, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. You see, because if you don't choose, the winds of our culture oftentimes chooses certain things. We choose bitterness and anger and anxiety and fear and desolation and loneliness and isolation. We have to choose joy. So how do we do this? Well, as we're studying from Mary's life, I want to share with you four things. Here's a roadmap. Four things to guide us in a theology of joy as we're reflective of the Christmas story to believe in. Here's the first thing that I want to share with you. The first thing is for us to know that joy comes out of relationship with God. That our true joy comes in knowing God and most importantly being known by God. Right now, as I speak, I believe the God of the universe, the God who spoke the universe into formation, this God knows you by name. This God loves you and sees you and acknowledges you, desires the best, desires your peace, your flourishing in your life. This God of the universe is for you. See, when we study Mary's song, it's very clear to me that this young woman, and there are scholars who debate her age, we know that she's young which was the cultural norm of that time. She was somewhere probably between 12, 15, maybe 16, but she's young. But what's so interesting is that despite her age, what we know very clearly from listening to this prayerful song is that she knew God. She knew God and she knew that God also knew her. 
That means our knowledge of God, our relationship with God is not predicated on your age. It's not predicated on your social economic status and where you live. It's not predicated on your gender or your color of your skin. God's access, God's love for you is made available to anyone and everyone who desires to know God. And in essence, that's the story of Christianity. It's not just about humanity trying to pursue after God in our own human efforts. It's about a God who came down and near to us. But you see, this prayer that Mary sings, I want you to know this song isn't a random song. It's not just a song that just comes out of the blue, out of thin air. There's substance to this song. It comes out of a regular, daily faith and engagement and pursuit of God. So faith, friends, isn't just something that we do for 70 minutes on a Sunday morning. Faith is something that we embody and live every single day, never in perfection because that doesn't exist. Never in perfection, but there's an earnestness to Mary's faith, an earnestness that we want to invite you to as well. You see, Mary has faith. Mary prays. Mary sings. Mary seeks after God, and that's where that joy, that peace, that hope comes from. It's not perfect. It's not manufactured. It's not obligatory. It's not robotic. There's a real joy in experiencing God's presence every single day. Joy comes out of a relationship with God. This is really important because sometimes in our world today, we make the mistake, even among Christians, we make the mistakes of acknowledging the gifts that God gives us, and we think that's what builds faith. Uh, Let me try to drive this point with an example here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm 52 years old. Praise God for Asian genes. And so uh, I, I'm 52 years old, right? You guys, have you guys heard that phrase, black don't crack, Asians don't raise in white? So, oh, sorry, there's nothing for white people. So anyway, sorry, 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 sorry. It's my first visit. That was an inappropriate joke. Anyways, so let's go back to the story here. So when I was a sophomore in college, When I was a sophomore in college, I uh, was going home for Christmas break. My friend drops me off at our home, and as I walked up the stairs to our parents' home, my parents were waiting at the top of our home. And they said, Eugenia, also uh, in Korean, which means Eugene, welcome home. And then they said, we have a Christmas present for you. Now, you would assume that I would be super, super excited about this revelation. But to be honest, in our family, gifts were not something that caused great joy. Because all the gifts had to do with academics in our home. right? All the gifts, SAT books, GRE books, (laughs) PSAT books, uh, World Book Encyclopedia sets, and the list goes on. And so when they said we had a present for you, I was like, oh, no, not again. (laughs) My father says, follow me downstairs. I'm following my father downstairs to our basement, and I'm confused. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this cat just, like, created a study hall in the basement (laughs) of our home. I follow him downstairs, and then out of the blue, he takes out car keys. I'm confused. And then he points to the garage, and as I turn, behold, there it was, a 1967 Volkswagen Bug convertible. It was orange, but beggars can't be choosers. And I still remember this like it was just yesterday. I grabbed those car keys from his hands. I snatched it away, ran to the car, put the top down, revved up the engine. If you've never been in an old school Volkswagen, the reverse is on the opposite corner. And back then, I had beautiful, flowing, black, beautiful Asian hair. Okay? 
And I just drove <laughs> around San Francisco for hours that day. It was only on my way back, I wondered, did I actually thank my father? Like I was at that moment so enamored by that gift. And here's the thing, God desires to give gifts to his children. But what idolatry is, it's the slow seduction or the mistake of us being so enamored, so focused, so obsessed by the gifts that God gives us that we begin to worship gifts. But what happens in the process, we completely forget the giver of gifts. So what's Christmas? Christmas, all the stuff that happens are good things. They can be good things, but when we focus on the good things of Christmas and neglect the giver of gifts, then we miss it all together. Friends, the first one is joy comes out of relationship, not with the gifts, but out of relationship with the giver of gifts with God. Here's the second thing, the second point that I want to share with you is don't be a slave to your circumstances. Now, we all know that even as Christians, God never promises in the scriptures, he never promises us perfection, never promises a life of absolute bliss, absolute health and wealth. If your Bible promises you absolute perfection, let's switch Bibles. In fact, I don't want your Bible because it's a false Bible. Never in the word of God. In fact, we know that as faithful servants of God, and how do we know this? All you have to do is open up the word of God and God's people who loved God experienced, yes, beautiful things, but also experience hardships and challenges, that they experience moments of doubt and moments of fear. In fact, right now, if you're experiencing doubt and fear, sometimes the challenge of pastors is to berate you. I'm not here to berate you. I'm here to say, welcome to church. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that New Hope is a place where people come to find hope. Can you imagine if your church was called, we have it all together hope? (laughs) It would be nobody. (laughs) Nobody would be here. We're glad that you're here, but just to give you a glimpse of what transpired during the time when Jesus enters into human history. Because right now, uh, there are some tough and challenging and difficult things happening in our nation and around the world. But do you also know that that has always been the case? Always been the case during the time of Jesus' birth. Here's just a glimpse, 30,000 foot level, not even going into the details. 30,000 foot level, we know, for example, something about Herod the Great from the book of Matthew. Anytime any leader forces their constituents to add the name the great after their name is not worth following. Herod the Great from the book of Matthew orders the murder of all male children, boys two years and under. It was an evil time. Herod is so paranoid about possibly losing his power and throne, he actually has three of his own sons murdered. One of his ten wives murdered, and countless more. Caesar Augustus 
a wider picture issues, a decree for a census, and the motivation wasn't for better governance, to better care for people. It was to be able to better tax people with greater accuracy for the sake of building military expansion for overall imperial control. Historians call it Pax Romana. This was the version of making Rome great again. People were under rule. The Israelites, first with the Egyptians, then the Syrians, then the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and the list went on. It was a, an evil, dark time. And during that time, between the Old and New Testament, there was this time of silence, or at least apparent silence. For 400 years, to our knowledge, there were no prophets raised up by God, no brave women or men empowered by the Holy Spirit to call the people to repentance and turn back to God. There were no amazing miracles, signs, or wonders recorded. Just silence. And all along, yes, there's a lot of division in our world today, but the division during the time of Jesus' birth between the Jews and Samaritans, the disparity between the rich and the poor, it led people to think and ask the question, has God abandoned us? If we're honest, there may be moments in your life and in my life we've actually asked the question, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Have you forgotten us? And there's also not just the larger societal division and pain, there's a lot of personal issues. Can you imagine, for example, what was going on in Joseph and Mary's mind? In today's Perspective. We want to look back at history, and as Christians, we want to criticize Joseph for his lack of faith. But seriously, seriously, if you were Joseph and your fiance basically said, Hey, Joseph, guess what? I'm pregnant. The Holy Spirit. you would probably go, cuckoo. We'd probably back away. Can you imagine the fear that Mary must have experienced? Like Mary, the angel says, don't be afraid. Why? Because Mary was afraid. Can you imagine the times and the occasions nearly every single day when eventually the word got out that everywhere that Mary went, people were gossiping about Mary. And by gossiping, I'm talking about words that we use to denigrate and degrade people. Friends, what we learn here is that Jesus came during the darkest hour, bringing hope and light. Even in times of apparent silence, have faith that God is not absent. God is at work. Friends, right now, God is still at work. God is not yet done. He's not yet done in your life. He's not yet done in your family. He's not yet done at this church. He's not yet done in this nation. God is not yet done in the world. God is still on the move. And so we have faith. The third thing that we can learn from the story here is that it's one that's painfully challenging, but it's this, say no to the comparison game. Now, I know that it was different, but it was still a challenge to Mary because Mary was constantly being compared to other people. People saw her and the rumors about her life, and they were beginning to basically juxtapose, compare her life to others. 
And that comparison game is still ever so strong today. In fact, I suspect that if you're like me, there are people at church right now watching online or just sitting here and we're struggling with the comparison game. Why? So much that psychologists are telling us that right now we are experiencing by far the greatest spike in something called social anxiety disorder. Some of us here struggle with it and we don't know. You see, when I was in second grade, as a student at Sherman Elementary School, I was comparing myself with the 20 other students in class. But what's changed because of technology, our gadgets, our smartphones, our social media, is that I'm no longer comparing myself with just 20 other students. I'm comparing myself with the whole school, the whole neighborhood, the whole city. I'm comparing myself not just with the Smiths across the street. I'm comparing myself with the Jones, the Smiths, the Kims, the Wongs, the Tanakas, the Patels, the Johansons, the Ivanovs, the Adebayos. I'm trying to be as inclusive as possible right now. (laughs) But that's the truth. You're now comparing yourself with anyone and everyone. And so as a result, we're trying to project more of an image rather than the root of our identity coming from Jesus and Jesus alone. Man, I I, want to just confess, if you follow me on social media, you'll realize that all of my photos are in a certain angle that makes me look tall. Like people look at me and go, wow, you're not 6'4". What's going on? Uh, Did you know, for example, that there's a place that you can go to uh, in Los Angeles where for $64 an hour, you could take photos in a private fake jet. Uh, If Pastor Reese and I were to go there, um, I don't know about you, but my, my pose would be this right here. Uh, Can you guys zoom in on this a little bit? (laughs) Oh, man. You got to work on your pose, and we'll take a photo together. But, But you see what I'm trying to say? There is no end to the comparison game. This person wasn't a pastor or a theologian, but there's a truth to what Theodore Roosevelt once said when he said, comparison is the thief of joy. In a world where we define success as the person with the most toys wins at the end, success at all costs, if we're not careful, we begin to drink the Kool-Aid where the rule of life is all about success, and about the image of that success. This is why when you listen to Mary's song, she's basically saying, I am who God says that I am. I am his beloved, and our identity isn't in stuff or an image, but our identity is in Christ and Christ alone. Listen to these words from Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, 7. And because we are his children, that's the good news. When you place your trust in Jesus Christ, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Here's the fourth point, friends, and it's this. We can sing a song of joy. We can sing a new song because God offers us the joy of salvation. Friends, the story of Christmas is about the joy of salvation. It's a a difficult story to reflect on. Let me unpack this a little bit. Some of you here are parents. Some of you here might be parents of young children. If you're a parent, you were once a parent of young children. Some of you right now are expecting children. 
And if you are an expectant parent, when a child comes to, to life, I mean, let's be honest, as parents, we begin to have hopes and dreams and, and visions. We have a, a destiny that we desire for our children. And it's always to flourish. Always. When we look at the pictures of our children or you see the pictures of other children, let's be honest, every baby is just so adorable. And if you think that a child isn't adorable, repent. (laughs) And yet, the story of Christmas is this, that Jesus is born. Jesus is born to show us the way and to go to the cross. Let me say that one more time. His destiny is to show us the way and to go to the cross so that you and I would experience the joy of salvation. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, 11 says these words, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Friends, again, great joy for all the people. That includes you. Praise be to God. That includes people that are not here. That includes people that are outside these walls that have not yet come to the revelation of Jesus. The good news of salvation isn't just for some people. It's not just for the privileged, just for the powerful, just for the influential, just for the rich. It is for all people. It's not just for Americans. This good news is also for Syrians and the Yemenis, and the list goes on. There is no border or boundary that somehow restricts the good news of Jesus' salvation for the world. This is truly good news. As we close, I want to just share a a, a story with you, if I can, to help. I I pray that I, I hope that it just takes deep root into your life. If you're like me, I became a follower of Jesus at the age of 18. And then as a pastor, you have many Advent seasons. And then if you're not careful, it becomes like a routine. And the last thing that we want for you is to go through the religious routine of the Advent Christmas season. Because if you do that, we're going to miss the absolute scandalous, radical nature of what the birth of Jesus is all about. It is mind-boggling and absolutely scandalous that the God of the universe, the God of the cosmos, would choose to send his son to be consumed by flesh and bone to become one of us, to show us the way and to go to the cross. To help give an illustration, I brought this fish bowl here, and there's a fish. I want this fish to prosper. Because as the fish bowl owner, of course, I want the fish to prosper. I I read the story once in a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. So as I try to recount the story, Because my desire for this fish is to flourish, I give it a name so that this fish knows that it's seen and known. Let's call the fish hope. I created a world. There's rocks underneath. In my desire for the fish to flourish, I create what I think is the perfect world. 
I want to create a world where there's beauty. And so there's vegetations. I want this fish to be able to have joy and recreate. And so I place. But every time I try to do that which is meant for good, the fish scurries away. I don't know if you can see it, but it's on the other side. So as the owner of this fish and of this bowl, that truly is my heart. But every time I try to create things that are meant to be good, the fish only knows one thing, fear. It misconstrues, misunderstands. The author of this book then begins to share this revelation that's mind-boggling. He says that the only way after reflecting upon this exercise, the only way that he could truly let this fish know that his desire is for the fish to be loved and for the fish to flourish. The only way is that he, the author, would have to become fish and enter into this world. It's mind-boggling. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Friends, this is the good news. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. During this Advent season, as you're reflecting upon what song do you sing, please take time to pause and know that God has sent his Jesus to be near and not just near, to become one of us, to show us the way and to go to the cross so that you and I would have life and life everlasting. So Father, we again thank you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for revealing this good news that Jesus became flesh and blood, and moved into the neighborhood. May we not only ourselves experience this truth, but may New Hope be that church that continues to move into the neighborhood for your glory and for your honor. And all God's people said, amen. amen. amen.